Cheers. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you all very much for joining us today. We are now into day five of our circuit break lockdown. The Minister of Health and Social Care is here with me to provide another update on the vaccination programme, and we also have the Director of Public Health on Zoom. I know that many of you will be keen to hear the latest on the cases that were being looked at into, into by our contact tracing team. Just before I hand over to Dr. I'm able to confirm that the test results that we were waiting for in connection with St Mary's Primary School have now all come back. We conducted over 90 tests and they are all negative. Now this is encouraging and I'm sure it will be reassuring to many and of course it is. But as we have said on a number of occasions, a test is only a snapshot of a moment in time. Those who were identified as close contacts will still have to isolate until we are sure that there is no longer any risk. I would again like to thank the head teacher, all the staff, parents and the pupils for doing the right thing and enabling the contact tracing team to do their job. I would now like to hand over to the Director of Public Health for an update on cases and contact tracing. Dr Hewitt. Thank you, Chief Minister. So first of all, I'll pick up on the case of the child that you've just alluded to. And as you rightly say, the very good news there is that the over 90 high risk contacts have all come back with negative tests. They are self-isolating. They will have further tests because it is possible that they will go on to become positive and indeed become infectious. But they shouldn't be a risk to others because they are now managed within self-isolation. The good news is that at the time they were out and about, they were negative, so they weren't an infection risk at that point. In relation to the other case from last week, the adult who presented with symptoms, one colleague from a work setting has tested positive there, and again, that is under control through self-isolation and onwards testing, so no wider implications on that one. Another case from last week also has a contact who tested positive at day seven. And again, because they were already in isolation and were negative at the point at which they went into isolation, they are not out in the community posing any further risk of transmission. On Saturday evening, a positive case was confirmed in someone who presented to COVID-111 with symptoms. Contact tracing identified a significant number of high-risk contacts relating to social activities across the new year period. A number of these contacts have now also had positive tests, and so further and wider contact tracing is ongoing. Although in terms of timing, all the current cases are likely ultimately to link back to one or other of the clusters that we had across Christmas and the new year period, in reality, we are now at a point where we're never likely to actually be able to firmly confirm that one way or another due to the passage of time and the fact that there may well be people who are part of that transmission chain who didn't present with symptoms, probably because they remained asymptomatic, but who, even if we identified them now, would return a negative test. So we will never know exactly what that chain of transmission was. In any event, the focus now needs to be on containing and closing onward transmission from the current cases and their contacts and ensuring that we stop and contain any wider spread out into the community. In relation to the case from Saturday, we've identified a number of venues that they visited. We'll be publishing the details of the venues and the relevant times after this briefing. The visits now date back really at least a week and potentially further back. So anyone who may have been in one or other of the venues at a relevant time is at low risk. As time has already gone on, the risk is already reducing. So the message to, to take away on that is as always, people should remain vigilant for any symptoms that may be COVID related and self isolate and report immediately they notice this to COVID 111. Thank you. Thank you very much, Henrietta. <laughs> We are starting to understand how the virus has been spreading in our community. We have often talked about the challenges we face dealing with a disease that is all too often invisible. 
If everyone showed symptoms, this would be far easier to identify and isolate. But this is not the case. It may be a third of cases people will not show any symptoms at all, and others may have symptoms that they shrug off as something else. And we have been working hard to shut down each possible infection chain as we see them. This is, of course, an incredibly tough job. As you've heard from Dr Hewitt and others recently, the most powerful weapon we have is our behaviour. We have done almost one week of our circuit break lockdown. We brought this in because of the perceived risk to our most vulnerable people and our vaccination programme. The Council of Ministers met this morning to hear from our clinical and public health professionals. We heard about the situation in the United Kingdom and how, in the words of the Chief Medical Officer there, the next three weeks will be the worst of the pandemic. We also heard from the Chief Executive of the Department of Health and Social Care about the significant pressures on our hospitals. Winter is always a tough time for bed space. This winter is no exception. Capacity is stable, but extremely limited. The Council of Ministers agreed that we cannot afford to sit and wait to see what the impact on our health and social care services will be in two weeks. Some of this is for the government to do, but success is in your hands. I know that many of you have seen the circuit break, have taken the circuit breaks period seriously, but this, the measures that we put in place and your response to them was based on a risk, something that we were worried might happen. But what we now have is a threat, something that we know is happening. We now know that the virus is in our community and spreading. We have therefore decided to make some changes to the measures in place. We are not suggesting at present that we are going to extend the length of this lockdown, but we need to take another step to tighten the measures in and around the island. We have done one week well, but for the next two weeks we have to do even better. We need to turn the screws another notch and lock down a little harder. We can get back to normal, but only if we get the next two weeks absolutely right. The Council of Ministers decided this morning to revise a number of the measures we have in place. These will come into effect from one minute past midnight, Wednesday night into Thursday morning. Let me start with education. In those education facilities that are still open, we will be further tightening our processes. The first point is to make is why the hubs are there. They are there for vulnerable children and the children of essential workers when this is essential, where they have no alternative possible arrangements. We will be reinforcing bubbles within schools. This is about keeping together children of the same age groups or those who have come to the hub from the same school. We will be issuing further advice on face coverings in schools today. This will continue to strongly advise face coverings for all adults and secondary age students where they can. We do have a small number of face coverings available, but our preference would be that students bring their own. If primary age children have a mask of their own, we would encourage them to wear it also. We have also considered whether we need to make changes to the retail. We were satisfied that, broadly speaking, people and businesses are following the current guidance. We are not proposing major changes to current measures, but we will be requiring garden centres to close. We will also require all hardware and building supplies to close to the general public. They can remain open for trade customers. They can continue to offer click and collect services to others. The message here is clear. Essential shopping is allowed, but please do not go shopping for things that are not essential. Borders, I know, continue to cause a great deal of debate. We carefully considered whether we needed to further tighten our borders. We believe that the changes we brought in from the 23rd of December are proportionate and appropriate to the threat. To remind everyone, this is three tests on day 1, 7 and 13, and a self-isolation that can only be with someone you travelled with. These measures work if people respect the rules. Self-isolation means just that. 
given the rates of infection across the United Kingdom and beyond, we have to assume people travelling here are at a high risk of infection and should be treated accordingly. Yes, you can drop off things for them, but any contact with them is a breach of their legal direction and it puts you, your family and your community at risk. If you are considering travel off island, please think very carefully before you do. We are not at this stage going to prevent people from leaving the island. But as I have said before, we cannot rule out closing our borders at short or no notice. In short, if you leave, we cannot guarantee how easy it will be to return in the future. We will keep all of these measures under regular review, as you would expect. If we need to tighten them, we will. But the important message I would like you to take away today is that while a certain amount of this is for government to do, success is in your hands. I need you to think before you act in everything you do. The UK's Chief Medical Officer, Chris Whitty, has used a phrase that I think is important to us. He has asked everyone to act as if they were infected with COVID. I know the situation across is not the same as here, but this is the right way to think. Every time you are considering leaving your home, think again about whether your journey is really essential. If you were infectious, how many people might you be spreading it to? And before you get into your car, let's not forget any incident on the roads can put tremendous pressure on our health and emergency services. They are under enough pressure from COVID. Do you want to risk adding to that? And even if you are just going out for your daily exercise, do you really need to drive there? Exercise locally if you can. Respect the space of others as you want them to respect yours. We have been receiving reports of certain of our outdoor spaces becoming crowded at times of the day. Please use common sense. If there are too many people, go somewhere else or come another time. Again, take a moment and picture what you would do if everyone was infectious. Walk on by. At the moment, we do not want to limit exercise or close sites. We are hoping that people will see that this is the responsible thing to do. But if we need to, we will. And if it is essential to pick up food or medicine, surely the best thing would be to assume you are infectious. Keep your distance, wear a face covering, wash your hands. If you are tempted to allow someone to come into your home, even if it is someone you know well, or it is for something essential, like care of an emergency, consider what it would mean if they were infectious. You don't know if they are infectious or not. Assume they are. Do you want to put yourself and your family at risk? We have asked people who can to work from home. Any person-to-person -person contact increases the risk of spread. If it can be avoided, then it must be. This is a call out to employers. Do everything you can to do to enable your employees to stay at home. Do you want your company to become the next cluster? Please do the right thing. We must not forget why we are all doing this. Yes, we want to get back to the normality as soon as we can, but it is critical that we protect the rollout of our vaccine programme. The situation on this changes regularly, so I would like to invite the Minister for Health and Social Care to give us an update. Thank you, Chief Minister. Although I only gave an update on vaccinations at the end of last week, things have moved on, and with it being a matter of national importance, I feel it's important that a further update is given. Many will have seen that a third vaccine, the Moderna vaccine, has been um, approved for use by the United Kingdom. This will be exactly the same as the other vaccines, and we will be entitled to an element of the UK supply based on our size of population, which is 0.13% of the overall UK population. That means we would be entitled to 13,000 doses, enough to vaccinate 6,500 people. The UK is not expecting any supplies of Moderna until the spring, so that will be the earliest that this vaccine will become available for use. Again, like other vaccines, the UK's deliveries are spread out between now and September and we do not receive all of our entitlements at once. 
There are also logistical challenges with the Moderna, just as there is with the Pfizer vaccine, in that it has to be transported at minus 20 degrees Celsius, although once, once defrosted, it is less logistically challenging in that it can be stored at fridge temperature for up to 30 days and can maintain stability at room temperature for up to 12 hours. The over 80s letters that I referred to last week have been prepared and have started being issued to those who are mobile. In fact, I'm delighted to say that we have carried out our first over 80s vaccination today at Newlands. Those in this category who are housebound will be contacted separately to make arrangements for them to have their vaccination. With the letter, we have included a handy leaflet which should address any questions people may have around the vaccination and the process. Once people are in receipt of their letter, they will be able to arrange their appointment via 111. I do need to stress again that if you are in this category, it is important that you wait to receive your letter before contacting 111. They can only arrange your appointment once you have your letter. The operational processing for the vaccination of care homes is now also complete and the final clinical protocols are in the process of being finalised. We therefore currently intend to begin the rollout to residential homes later this week. The current plan is that we will have completed the vaccination of those in care and residential settings by the end of this month. Turning to another topic, and I, I know has raised some queries in relation to patient transfers and isolation upon return. It is possible where patient transfers upon return require, require care in the home for them to isolate within their households with the whole household isolating with them. There is the ability for a patient transfer to be issued with a modified direction notice in these instances. It is important though to emphasise that this is a clinical decision around if the person needs to isolate at home in order that other members of the household can care for them. If they, for medical reasons, need this, then it is possible for that to be done. Thank you, Chief Minister. And thank you, David. And on that positive note, I would now like to go to the media for questions. And first we have is Tim Glover from Manx Radio. Good afternoon, Tim. Fast am I. Good afternoon, fast am I. Could I just get uh, clarification of uh, the, the cases situation from Dr Henrietta Ewart? I've got a lot of people saying they didn't hear what the figures were today. Henrietta. Which figures? What number of new cases, number of people we've got at the moment. Okay. Who are... We have a total of 21 active cases at the moment, but some of those, of course, are returning travellers. In terms of the new cases um, of interest that I was reporting on today, the main one is the symptomatic case that was identified late Saturday evening and the ongoing contact tracing around that that is identifying further positives in their close contacts and we'll tell you about that as we complete that process and have clarity on what those numbers are and also on the chains that we've had to follow down as a result of them. Um, so beyond that, um, we recapped the issue around the child and the high-risk contacts in the school setting. Um, and I think Chief Minister also spoke about that, so I'm presuming people are happy with that one. Um, beyond that, we had a workplace colleague of the adult who presented with symptoms last week who tested positive already in self-isolation so no wider contact tracing implications there and the same situation applied to another close contact of a case from last week who also was negative on identification but is now tested positive during self-isolation so again no further contact tracing issues there. Thank you, Henrietta. And maybe, David, you might like to um, give the total number of tests for everyone. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the total number of figures that are going to appear on the website. Uh, Tim, apologies. I think I got ahead of myself with vaccinations and I didn't give that out. So the figures that will be coming out onto the website, total tests undertaken is now 23,826. 12 awaiting results, which means total concluded tests of 23,814. In the last 24-hour period, the number of tests undertaken is 296. 
They, in the last 24-hour pe reporting period, that means there's six new cases out of that, with total confirmed cases being 403, and that relates to what um, the, the Director of Public Health has just referred to in terms of the links between cases. And none of those cases are currently in hospital. Thank you. Uh, the main thrust of uh, today has been stay at home, but... A lot of people commenting on how much busier it seems out and about when compared to the previous lockdown at any stage of that. Uh, are people being a little bit too complacent? Well, I, I think quite a few people, Tim, have said to me that they're, they're seeing an awful lot more traffic on the roads. And that's why we've messaged today that it really, if you need, do you really need to go out there? So we've come up with some pretty firm messaging on the need to stay at home and we are revisiting the number of um, pupils that are using our hub schools to see whether they really are essential so the um, on the face of it it does look as if maybe some more people than should be are getting out and about that's why we've asked people really to think to presume that they may have the virus and what would they do is their journey really essential and i'm just you know, relying on the, the Great Manx public to, to think and um, reduce their activity for the coming fortnight. Thank you. Thanks very much, Tim. Now we move on to Paul Moulton from Isle of Man Television. Good afternoon, Paul. Fast am I. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. And Mr Ashford, do we need to add an R number now to these statistics, by the way? Uh, no, in terms of the R number, Paul, um, it goes back to a conversation I think we did in one of our one-to-one -one interviews during the last lockdown. When it comes to small jurisdictions, the R number isn't quite as relevant um, because where you get very, uh, very, you get very spikes in in statistical changes, which changes your R number. So, for instance, if you looked at Jersey and when Guernsey had their cluster and where the R number looked to be, um, it wasn't really representative. R numbers only really work in large jurisdictions they don't work so much in small jurisdictions where you may have spikes in numbers but i'll bring the director of public health in if she's anything further to add on that no that's absolutely correct um indeed looking across the uk even at local authority level and local authorities are bigger than our population the r number is not useful so yes i completely agree with what minister ashford has just said there OK, and, and just to be confirmed, it was eight more cases today? Because I was just looking at the website, it's not been updated yet. Is, is that the, the case? Eight more new cases today? On the lab figures, Paul, that I have in front of me, it's six that have been six. reported in the last 24-hour period. All right. And, and uh, my, se my second question is, uh, you say you've in, uh, given vaccination now to the first over 80s, but I've been talking to care homes, uh, and obviously these are out of town as well, and uh, obviously no sign of that, no sign of the lesser which is needed. And of course, uh, th this is a very important part of the process. And I think there's a bit of concern from some of the uh, nursing homes I've talked to because there's a situation going on. And I know the people that are working at the homes have now had their, their, their vaccines. But how long until you actually can see a, a full run and a full rollout yeah. to all the other people I, I, of over 80 years old? Yeah, as I just stated in the statement, we're planning to start the rollout to care, care home settings this week later this week, um, with an expectation that it will be completed by the end of January. In terms of the letters, I assume you're referring to the consent letters. For those that have capacity to do so, that will be done at the time of the vaccination. So in relation to the care home settings, we will be going, um, we will be going in with the consent letters for them to sign. It won't Has be consent. Signed off last. Uh, I was getting information. Is that done and dusted? I, sorry, Paul, I, I didn't hear the first part of that. Is a consent form finalised and signed off? I heard it was still being worked on. Yeah, my understanding now is that the clinical protocols um, will be in place in time for us to start rolling out at the end of this week. Right, thank you very much, Paul. Now we move on to Helen McKenna from Isle of Man Newspapers. Good afternoon, Helen. Fast am I. Good afternoon, Ministers. What's being done to ensure that public information about lockdown is reaching members of the community whose first language isn't English? Right, very good point, and I would hope that our um, website enables people to um, pre press a, a link which changes it into the, a language that they understand. If that's not the case, I will ensure that we do our utmost to help people whose English isn't um, their, their first language. Um, yeah, good, good question, Helen. I'll take that away and make sure that we have a good response. Okay, thank you. And then secondly, it's my understanding that if there's no 
community cases uh, before the end of lockdown, uh, the week of the 27th of January. If, if that is the case, then we can presumably come out of lockdown when scheduled. But if there are cases within the community uh, before the end, will we need to extend lockdown? Yeah, I think everyone is is really anxious to come out of this as quickly as they can, Helen. However, we must ensure that we do it safely. There's no point coming out bang on the day we, we expect to come out if we still haven't had um, put 14 days together of, of no cases in the community. So it's still too early to re, you know give people the date when we think we'll come out of. Obviously, we will do it as soon as possible, but it has to be done in a safe way to ensure that we don't shut down for the sake of it, just to stick to a date and then um, have an outbreak again. So obviously nearer the time we will update people, we, we'll give our updates as often as we can and we, we should you know, be a lot wiser this time next week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Helen. Now we move on to Alex Bell of BBC Isle of Man. Good afternoon, Alex. Fast am I. Good afternoon. Given that the only way out of this lockdown is community elimination, would ramping up, really ramping up testing in the community give us that golden zero faster? Right, well, this is an expertise that I think Dr Ewart would like to comment on. It's uh, one of her favourite areas. So, Dr Ewart, would you like to take this one? Yes, thank you for picking up this topic again. Um, as we've said before, population testing, mass testing, is unproven in any context. It may be useful in areas with very high circulating levels as part of multiple interventions to try and suppress infection rates. So it could be likened to an exercise in helping to mow the grass. The type of technology that's used for mass testing, the lateral flow devices, are not very accurate when they are administered by trained healthcare professionals, they pick up about 60% of positive cases. If they are used by people doing their own test, they pick up about 50% or less. So again, in our context, that's not useful. Our focus, as I said in, in my uh, presentation earlier, really has to be on as vigorously as possible tracing down the lines of communication, of transmission to identify cases and get them into self-isolation. Um, the place where the mass testing was most used across and where we should have data, but sadly it's not been published, not in a very full form anyway, is Liverpool. But I understand from colleagues working in that area that they had an uptake of about 25% of the population presented for random mass testing, um, which is a pretty good result really for a test that you you know you you volunteer for the issue there is the sort of people that come forward for mass testing may actually be the sort of people who are at comparatively low risk of being infected so you you may not be picking up those people you may not be engaging with those people who are at highest risk and one of the concerns across has been that People in certain groups, perhaps particularly those on precarious employment contracts in very low pay jobs, actually don't want to come forward for testing, may even be hesitant about presenting if they have symptoms because their household finances are so precarious that they can't afford to take the risk. So there are lots of different views on mass testing. I know there are some people who support it. There are a lot of others who are very questioning of it. I would have to say I'm in the latter group. Um, and I think on either basis, we await further evidence to show that it would be of any use in our current context. Mass testing is one thing, but while we have PCR capacity, are we not best to use it? In a targeted way, very definitely so. And as you know, from hearing about the contact tracing, we follow the lines of spread and that in itself as you've heard from the minister saying the current numbers that are coming forward to test are leading to large numbers now throwing it wider saying anybody who's concerned or actually just anybody come forth and have a test what you're effectively doing then is just looking for needles in haystacks you have all the problems about it's only a snapshot so somebody could test negative today go away rejoicing, let down their guard, 
stop being as careful about their behaviour as they might have been, yet tomorrow they could be positive or the next day. So our view is that we go with the targeted approach, following the lines of transmission, taking them wide, but following them, rather than just saying to the entire population, you know, rock up to the grandstand and have a test. If people were doing that, that would actually take capacity away, it would delay the capacity being targeted on the people that we most want to test. Okay. Thank you very much, Alex. Okay, we now we move on to Sam Turton from Jeff. Good afternoon, Sam. Fast am I. Fast am I, Chief Minister. And um, sorry if it does feel like we're going over ground again. It's just I'm getting messages through. We've had the figures presented in the same way throughout this whole series. Could we just get them again, please, just so people are certain exactly on what it is that they are? This, I presume this is the number of cases that we've, we've tested, yeah, test results, etc. Right, I'll ask David to yeah, give you that. If you bear with me one minute, Sam, as I put it away. Um, so the figures today over the 24-hour reporting period is total tests undertaken, 23,826. Awaiting results, 12. Concluded tests, therefore, 23,814. The number of tests undertaken in the previous 24-hour reporting period is 296. Our total confirmed case count stands at 403, which is an increase of six since the last reporting period, and there is zero of those um, of cases in hospital. And so off that, what is the number of total active cases? Sorry, was that 21? So the total number of active cases, if I... Sorry, I would have to go online for that one. Bear with me one moment. The total number of active cases on the lab figures I have in front of me is 27. Thank you. And then, um, during the first wave, we had, and first lockdown, we had this um, graph that used to be shared, which was um, focused on projections and data modelling. Do we have that this time for projections in the community? In terms of the graphs, the answer is no, Sam. Um, what we were trying to do with those graphs, we've got to go back and remember, um, we saw the trajectory of Italy, we saw where the UK was going. We were starting from afresh then. We hadn't got the health services set up to be able to cope with an influx of COVID-19. So what we were demonstrating was where the potential was for us to go. And if people go back and look at that graph, and it is still available online, where we started out, we were actually on the Italy trajectory until we put measures in place. What we're we're more interested in now with our strategy, which is an elimination strategy, is completely eliminating the virus from our community. So that's slightly different to what we were demonstrating in those graphs. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. Now we move on to Rob Pritchard from 3FM. Good afternoon, Rob. Fast am I. Good afternoon, Chief Minister. My first question to Minister Ashford, please, just with regards to the vaccination programme, we've already got the Pfizer rollout that has started and that's currently running at three days a week. You say that the Oxford jabs on Ireland, where you're waiting for the likes of the indemnities and the protocols to go through before that's rolled out. Once we get to the stage where we have two vaccines being rolled out, how confident are you that we actually have the staffing capacity to run both of those at the same time? I'm completely confident because I've seen the staffing planning and we actually already have it in place from the whole period from now to September. So we do have the staffing uh, capacity, including being able to operate on a hub system. And we also what we what we need to be absolutely certain on is, of course, the deliveries into the island, because should anything affect the UK's delivery schedule, that will have a knock on effect for us because we get ours as a per head population. But in terms of staffing, we are very confident that we have robust staffing plans to be able to manage both vaccines and be able to ramp up as the deliveries come into the island. Thank you. My second question to the Chief Minister. You've um, talked about reports from people to you about possibly more cars being on the roads, for example. You also made a, a brief comment just at the start of this conference about you know, making sure we minimise strain on the emergency services out on the roads. Is there maybe not an argument possibly for bringing back an all-island speed limit just to really minimise potential incidents? Well, it's been considered, Rob. Obviously, it's not the sort of thing we, we want to do straight away. If we see that there's an abuse and a, or um, people continue to um, travel in, in, in large numbers, then it's something we will have to consider. We considered it today but decided not to quite go that far just yet. We're trusting people to 
to be responsible, to look after their friends, themselves, their neighbours, their, their family, and to only go out if they really need to. And, um, but as I say, we'll review this in, in the future, should we feel the need to, Rob. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, Rob. And now we've come to Simon Richardson from Business 365. Good afternoon, Simon. Fast am I. Thank you, Chief Minister, and good afternoon. Um, I've been contacted by somebody who's concerned about the welfare of taxi drivers uh, that are booked by people who require a COVID test. Uh, obviously, it involves a lift to the test centre and back to their home. Now, drivers can have a person awaiting a test in their taxi for well over the standard 15 minutes, which can in some cases stretch to well over an hour. Now, with this in mind, drivers can potentially then have the virus literally in their back seat for lengthy periods of time, possibly multiple times a day. Now, the person who contacted me said that a different driver had a passenger coughing in the back seat of their car at the test centre and was told to close the window and cough back into the taxi rather than with the window open. Now, the obvious concern is that if the virus uh, was passed on to a taxi driver in this scenario, who then had multiple dealings with the public, even with a mask on, the chance of spread would be high. Now, the driver who's expressed the concern is now refusing to take passengers to the COVID testing area. Now, he and others would like to hear some clear guidance on what taxis should be doing and whether, in fact, they should really be doing this journey at all. Thank you for that, Simon. And I was led to believe that there were protocols in place for our taxi drivers um, for taking people up to the um, testing centre at the grandstand. Maybe Dr Ewart would like to expand on that or, or David? I'll bring the Director of Public Health in if I may, Chief Minister. Yes, thank you. You're, you're right, Chief Minister. There are protocols in place for this to mitigate the risk to the taxi drivers. Um, and that includes wearing of face masks, maintaining social distance while they're outside of the taxi, pre-ordering, pre-paying so that there's no exchange of cash or handing over of cards or anything during the actual journey to avoid any physical contact. Um, the passenger should be diagonally behind the taxi driver. They should all be wearing, both be wearing face coverings throughout. Um, they shouldn't be talking to avoid any, any spread by that route and they should have ventilation throughout by having the windows partially open. So I must say I'm concerned to hear the advice that appears to have been given in this case at the grandstand that they should shut the windows. That's not correct. Um, obviously, they need to ventilate the space because there is a risk both of direct droplet infection, but also of recirculation in the car aircon system if people are coughing into a closed system. And as we know very well, the risks of transmission are much lower in the open air, which would you know, equate to the windows open situation. So it appears that the advice they were given on that occasion was not correct. And we'll follow that up to make sure that doesn't happen again. Yeah, thanks Thank for you. that. Thanks for that. And as I say, as Dr. Hewitt just said, we will follow up on that to make sure that the advice is um, given again to all our taxi drivers. Thank you. And secondly, it's something that's actually just come in to me now. Somebody was asking um, for an update in respect of dental practices and basically are routine checkups essential at this time? David, do you want to take this? Yeah, on? I'll, I'll come in on that if I may, Chief Minister. DHSC is um, looking through all our protocols, including what is currently open, what needs to be restricted. We have done a very recent review. At the moment, we don't feel there is the concern to have to put restrictions in place for dental practices. Um, they are very professional people. They have very strict protocols around how they treat people, um, and they are adhering to that. So at the moment, we don't feel there is a need for that that kind of restriction but we are not saying that that doesn't mean that dependent upon what emerges over the next few days that we won't need to put restrictions in place but for the moment we believe the dentists are being very professional they have appropriate protocols and safety measures in place to protect the public thank you very much thank you very much simon and thank you all for your questions now i know it is important for us to get clear information out to the public as soon as possible we are doing our best within the constraints of confidentiality that I'm sure you will understand. We plan to hold these briefings on Wednesday and Friday this week. Of course, if there are important developments that need sharing immediately, we will do so. 
I know that as well as being an important tool, social media can lead to great anxiety and occasionally misinformation. Please ensure you get your information from trusted sources. If you do need information, please visit gov.im forward slash COVID-19 or call the community support line on 686 262 or email COVID-19 community support at gov.im. Use these lines so that we can keep the 111 line free for those who need it. I will leave things there for today. We can get through this if we work together, support each other and make the right decisions. And if we remember the basics, stay at home. Before you go out, ask yourself, is it really essential? If you go out, wear a face covering. If you have any symptoms, then stay at home and call 111 as soon as you can. Make the right decisions to keep you, your family and your island safe and to protect our vaccination programme. That's all for today. Thank you all very much.